Hello everybody and welcome to the latest episode of The Surge. Today I will be talking to you about trauma and pregnancy. Um, I found that, you know, pregnant trauma patients uh, tend to have a significant burden on the team. And I think that, you know, it goes to multiple things. First, we're human. It goes without saying. And, you know, seeing somebody who's pregnant... Uh, get subjected to the stress of, of, of a significant trauma that landed them in a hospital. It's a bit more than what we, we sign off for as surgeons, uh, physicians, uh, critical care specialists, and emergency doctors, and nurses, and, and allied health professionals, and physiotherapists, and physician assistants. I think it's a bit more than what we're... No amount of training gets you ready for that. Another reason is because you have three areas of expertise trying to treat one particular problem. And that goes back to the way that we're trained. It's, it's a limitation of, of our training and modern, modern medical training. I, I, I have no other way of putting it. The way that we're trained is to, to be specialty-centered. But recognize that, that the pregnant trauma patient is a patient-centered problem as opposed to a specialty-centered problem. And oftentimes, that makes people a little bit more stressed out and makes uh, their ability to um, exchange ideas more limited. I'm trying to be very politically correct today. I won't be for long. Wait till we get to the radiology section of this. The fact of the matter is it accounts for about 1 in 20 patients that you're going to see in a trauma emergency room. It's about 1 in 20 of of our trauma patients, 3 to 6%, and accounts to 5 to 20% of pregnancies. It's more likely to happen uh, in the third trimester than the first. And uh, the reason why is not because uh, they're falling more, uh, it, it, or mechanical reason due to an increase in, in overall body mass. It's because um, of the the nature of, of trauma in, in with bigger objects, like with bigger people. Uh, the energy transfers are significantly higher in the third trimester, and that's more likely uh, to bring a mother into the hospital. So MVCs uh, account for about 49% of these cases, with faults being 25%, um, assaults being 18%, and burns being 1%. Uh, it's, the reason why it's extremely important to know is not because... Uh, it's going to come up in your exams or going to come up in your practices, obstetricians, fetal maternal specialists, trauma surgeons, intensivists, or emergency doctors. It's because it's the number one cause of non-obstetric maternal death, with homicide being the main factor there. And it's uh, also a fairly significant cause of fetal death. Now, although MVCs form the bulk of the reason to present, Penetrating injuries uh, form the bulk of the reason why uh, we have mortalities in pregnant women. It's important to understand that um, although MVCs are, are the highest uh, cause of mortality in terms of blunt trauma population, penetrating injuries are the overall biggest killer in maternal trauma. And I think that part of the reason is because uh, we tend to conserve on them a little bit. You know, it's it's a problem in, the, in that we have a fear of operating on pregnant women, and uh, that fear is just not supported by the literature. You know, it's only supported by an old adage that says that a good surgeon knows when to operate, a great surgeon knows when not to operate, and so therefore you try and quote unquote conserve until you reach a point where you can't, and the patient might be in shock, they might be agonal, and as you'll see later, derangements in physiology in in, in pregnant women is an extreme derangement. Even the smallest is still an extreme derangement. So, if you look at the pure numbers, uh, penetrating injuries account for about 10% of all trauma admissions, but they also account for 14% of maternal mortality. Typical mortality is about 2% uh, in, 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 um, in most trauma centers. And, you know, for it to go up to 14%, that's almost a sevenfold increase and 70% of fetal mortality. In terms of burns, they're not very common. They only account for about 1% of all mortalities in the maternal population. 
or in the pregnant population. But uh, it's important to note that 40% body surface area burn accounts for 100% fetal maternal mortality. And anoxia secondary to inhalational injury accounts for about 70% fetal mortality. So what happens as part of pregnancy and how does it affect things physiologically? So as you have an increase in size of the uterus, an increase in size of the fetus, you have a compression of the uh, IVC, which reduces venous capacitance. You also have multiple uh, hormonal factors that also reduce your ability to produce a high systolic and diastolic blood pressure. These are largely placentally mediated and uterine mediated. And we'll get to that in a second. But in addition to that, you have a loss of laxity in the diaphragm and a compression of the stomach. The compression of the stomach makes intubation mildly problematic, but that can be solved by a, a burp maneuver. However, the compression and lack of dispens distensibility in the diaphragm affects transmural pressure such that your right ventricle might be a little bit stiff. Your right ventricular response might not be as volatile as it normally is or as responsive in general really you also have a reduction in uh, uh, for functional residual capacity and uh, you have a morphine need for you to use your accessory muscles for breathing as 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 gestation increases towards the second third trimester now the effects of the placenta and the fetus are also quite important to understand. The first is that the uterus in general will receive about 20% of your cardiac output by the third trimester. So already cardiac output limited. And you're also going to be stroke volume limited because of the IVC compression issue. So you're going to be heart rate dependent in terms of augmenting your cardiac output in a state of shock. In addition to that, you have multiple autocrine and paracrine changes that occur as a result of pregnancy that lead to a reduction in systolic and diastolic blood pressure and a reduction in overall arteriovenous capacitance and vasoconstriction and dilation mechanisms in general without going into details you have an increased affinity for oxygen but it's important to understand up to a ph of 7.2 or lower your fetus will start to retain more CO2 from the mother and will progressively become more acidotic. So a pH of 7.2 is no joke in, in, in pregnancy. And like we talked about, there are multiple other factors in play, but in general, you have hemodynamic factors at a cardiac level. You have uh, hematological factors, uh, including uh, blood volume initial increases, but then subsequent decreases that have effects on oxygen exchange at a uterine level and at a placental level and at a maternal level. And you have a lower threshold for shock with less overall compensation from a systolic and diastolic point of view. So looking at the fetus, in the first week, um, the embryo is basically a polycellular organism that is yet to be implanted. In, in, in general, viability is not there if something happens. And by, by the third trimester, um, the fetus adapts to the drop in uterine blood flow by diverting blood to the heart, brain, and adrenals. So by the third trimester, it effectively has a true adrenal response, and it will divert blood to the vital parts of its body. It also has a higher oxygen affinity, but like I said before, it's extremely important to note, high CO2s and acidosis are extremely poorly prognostic, no matter what the trimester is because you cannot exchange the CO2 back from the fetus into the mother. And therefore, effectively, your CO2 shifts into the fetus. It just piles up in the fetus. And that, that's, that's a big deal. And that's a big deal in terms of neurological function from the second trimester onwards. That's a big deal in terms of liver function in the first trimester uh, all the way through. Right, it's an extremely important factor, and it, it can lead to bigger problems uh, later down the line. In terms of fetal oxygen consumption, it doesn't really decrease because of the high affinity until you hit a saturation of fifty percent in the mother. It's important to note that by thirty-four weeks, the 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 pelvis doesn't really protect the fetus anymore, right? Uh, 
And as the fetus matures, uh, you're more likely to have fetal skull fractures or intracranial hemorrhages that are associated with pelvic fractures, in fact. So a pelvic fracture in the mother, you're more likely to have a skull fracture in the child. Injury patterns in general in the mother are the same as the child in the first trimester. However, by the second and third trimester, you have more solid organ injuries of the spleen and the retroperitoneum. You have more bladder injuries, you have more pelvic fractures, and more likely to have uh, placental abruptions and uterine rupture. Placental abruptions will occur even in minor traumas, about 120 minor traumas, and that's important to note because a lot of the, the force gets dissipated onto the uterus. That's also the reason why you have less uh, small bowel injuries. Unfortunately, the uterus kind of acts like an airbag and that it absorbs a lot of the force that would normally be directed towards a bucket handle injury, potentially, in the small bowel. When you look at mortality, the fetal loss rate varies between 5 and 15%. Um, it, it can occur across the board. Uh, it's strongly associated with maternal shock. 80% of them are due to maternal shock. 70% of them are due to penetrating abdominal trauma which goes back to my theory that it's because surgeons aren't operating as aggressively as they should. And 25% uh, have to do with a maternal pelvic trauma. It's of note that my theory that the fact that people aren't operating as much as they should in this patient population, the penetrating injuries in um, pregnant women, is based on a very limited case series. And I can't really prove it because you can never prove intent. But I, I would venture a guess that, that it's because of that. In terms of uh, maternal mortality, it's overall 1.5 to 3% compared to 2.7%. So there isn't an extremely increased amount of maternal mortality. Pelvic fractures, uh, penetrating injuries, and higher ISS scores are all associated with the mortality. Any ISS score above 12, associated with higher mortality, penetrating injury, mortality up to 60%. Other risk factors for fetal loss that have been identified in the literature include maternal hypotension, systolic below 90, um, high ISS score greater than 9, ejection from MVC, maternal pelvic fracture, a motorcycle accident, uterine rupture, and abruptio placentae. Now, when you approach a trauma patient in the trauma bay, do not deviate from what you know. You know how to do ATLS, so apply it. The key differences are a burp maneuver if you're going to intubate, a super umbilical approach to the DPL, and you need to feel for the uterus before you cut into it by mistake. And whenever you're putting in a chest tube, the nipple line is obviously unreliable. You should go slightly higher up by two or three spaces than you normally would. And note the fast is just as sensitive as in non-pregnant women, even in the hands of non-experts at obstetric ultrasound. If you can do a fast ultrasound on a non-pregnant person, you can do it on a pregnant woman and obtain the same sensitivity and specificity. It's also important to note that if you're thinking of intubating in a burn patient, do it. Because mortality at burns at 40% and above is 100%. The literature has no, no reports of survival to term in 40% or 50% uh, burns. All of them have ended up with a mortality, all those that were reported in the literature. When you're trying to answer the question as to whether or not you need fetal monitoring, it's important to note that the reasons or the goals of fetal monitoring are, number one, to assert viability before 24 weeks, and after 24 weeks, to assess whether or not labor need, might need to be induced, the patient might be in active labor, or you might need to do a perimortem or high-risk cesarean section. The current guidelines advocate for uh, four hours, which is 100% sensitive for placental absorption. And uh, in high-risk populations where there is a uterine tenderness, significant abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, uh, contraction frequency of more than 10 minutes over the monitoring of four-hour period, rupture of the membranes, atypical or abnormal fetal heart rate patterns, or high-risk mechanisms of injury or serum fibrinogen of less than 200, the current recommendation is 24 hours of monitoring. In terms of imaging, and, and this is a forever problem that I don't understand. So the literature is pretty clear on this, as are the guidelines for the past five years, since 2015. The lifetime risk of prenatal exposure is considered to be similar from exposure during childhood. Anything that's five rads or below 
pertains to less than a lifetime risk of 2%, 0.6% in childhood. If I did everything on that list, which you never routinely do, like I would never do an upper GI series, then do a cholecystography, then do a lumbar spine radiography, then do a pelvic radiography, then do a hip and femur, then do a retrograde pylog pylography, then do an abdominal radiography, then do a multi-view of the lumbar spine, then do a barium enema, then do an intravenous pylogram, then do a pan scan. I would never do that. Nobody would ever do that, I would hope. But if I did everything on that list in one day, I still would barely hit five rats, okay? Now, bear in mind also that if you took a trip from where I'm living right now in Kuwait to Atlanta and back, you would be exposed to the same amount of radiation as you would get from one CT scan, one pan scan. So that's very important to note. These two things are extremely important to note. The risk of you not assessing your patient completely when they're symptomatic for fear of radiation, not operating on them for fear of complication, and not addressing the patient-centered problem of trauma and pregnancy is just far too high for me to find it acceptable for you not to do it. And the studies agree with what you're doing. They agree with doing radiographs. They agree with even using gadolinium, although I wouldn't, but they agree with it. They agree with routine blood testing prior to doing it, so you know where you're going. They agree to you doing a fast ultrasound at the bedside, point-of-care ultrasound. And they agree with the fact that you are do going to have to do a diagnostic peritoneal lavage, but also say that considering the risk of everything, a CT scan can be done as an acceptable alternative, point number 19 of the recommendations. So in my eyes, the literature is fairly clear. Yes, there is a risk to radiation, but in the trauma population, the particular field of trauma, the risks and the benefits in patients who are of high risk, like I, we just mentioned, so patients who have pelvic fractures, patients who have significant abdominal pain, patients who have a significant amount of hemodynamic compromise, even one systolic below 90 is a problem. Patients with acidosis, which may not seem severe outside the context of pregnancy, but within the context of pregnancy is clinically significant, is just far too big a risk for me to live with. If I feel very strongly about it, I'm going to get the CT scan, and I have done it before, and I will gladly stand by anybody who does. So, exposure of five rats has not been associated with any fetal abnormalities. It's deemed to be safe. These are the EAST guidelines. So you have three different bodies of literature. One local national Canadian. One from the Eastern Association of Surgeons and Trauma. And one from the obstetricians themselves. The one thing that I'll tell you is, you're going to have to have a radiologist who can understand the situation with you. And that takes a while. Developing partnerships with radiology where they understand these things is extremely important. Now, another question I get asked is damage control. Is it okay for you to leave the abdomen open? Well, let's look at what damage control is. So by definition, if you're doing damage control surgery, your patient is more than likely in shock going into the operating room. And we know that in uh, pregnancy, uh, we have a very hard time detecting shock. You'll notice I never gave you exact numbers because in trauma, I don't believe in them. The stress response is just too sensitive. The vasoplege is somewhere in there. And the IVC being compressed makes things a little bit unreliable. So apart from end perfusion markers like lactate-based deficit and pH, they're very, very variable. Okay? And that's important to note. Even urine output's variable because you're compressing the ureters, especially towards the third trimester. So by definition, you going for damage control in a pregnant uh, woman means that you're, you're already hypotensive and you're already tachycardic. And so closing the abdomen might be of a prohibitive risk. And in fact, when you look at the literature, doing damage control with delayed abdominal closure in both trauma and non-trauma patients has a 50 to 80% survival. So yes, you can do it. And the literature supports it. And I would do it. And there have been various case series. And one thing seems to be consistent and true. You should be doing it. The question becomes timing of the delivery, and there doesn't seem to be a clear answer yet.
But I would assume you'd have to weigh the risks and benefits of fetal viability, and you'd have to consider it um, depending on how well uh, the patient responds to your surgical intervention and their overall risk. You know, is there something else that you need to do down the line that's more definitive? Is there a certain medication that you want to give that you can't give to pregnant women? All of these things have to be put into play. When it comes to CPR, it has to be in the lateral decubitus position to relieve the obstruction of the IVC. And I'm going to be honest with you, uh, neonatal postmortem survival is about 70% if you make the decision correctly and early. So I would say the minute you start considering CPR in a pregnant woman, you should consider a perimortem cesarean section. So after 20 weeks of gestation, the reality of the situation is you have a chance at survival. And if your patient is arresting, you're looking for the chance of survival. I would say that you're setting yourself up to win if the viability is greater than 24 weeks gestation, you have better viability, sorry. In cases of maternal death with unknown gestation between zero and five minutes, in cases of greater than 50% body surface area burns, in severe polytraumas where the patient might arrive in severe distress if not agonal and you're considering a thoracotomy for resuscitation purposes, in cases of fetal distress, premature rupture of membranes and patients in active labor, you should consider doing a straight laparotomy incision and a classical cesarean section to deliver the baby as soon as possible. It's because in these cases, although the risk of maternal death is relatively high, like we talked about earlier, the risk of feet, the, the sense of fetal viability statistically is very good. It's over 50%. And for agonal patients, I'd take 50%. You always have to try. Remember that. If you're going to work in trauma, if you're going to work in any sort of acute care specialty, you always have to try. Until such point where the person's physiology is not compatible with life. So survival rates for quote-unquote crash cesareans or perimortem cesareans vary between 60 and 90%, 60 at 25 weeks and 90 at 28 weeks with major long-term defects being 20% at 28 weeks and 25% at 70 weeks. So you have pretty good numbers there for perimortem cesarean sections. And I wouldn't really call it postmortem more so than perimortem. So the take-home message here is you need a healthy mother to have a healthy baby. And if you're going to work in, in any acute care field, whether it's emergency medicine, ICU, surgery, trauma, you're going to need to accept the fact that morbidity will happen for you to get a mortality. The favorable mortality rates come with some morbidity. And, you know, it's the toughest thing that you're going to have to do is make these decisions sometimes. This is Saud Al-Zaid. Thank you for listening and watching. And please subscribe and let me know what you think.